I invite y'all to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Open up to Acts chapter 16, everyone. That's where we're going to spend a good portion of our time together this morning. And if you're watching online, I invite you all to open up your Bibles as well. We're grateful you're watching online. I know we have many visitors here as well. If you have any questions, uh, we just want to get to know you better. And we just want to be able to share with you the best news of all. Thank you all for being here this morning. Acts chapter 18, we're going to go through it, um, hit some highlights for the sake of time. It's a really powerful, uh, a series of powerful stories. Uh, If you look on the screen, the first few verses there, verses 6 through 8, it's strange. God himself stops Paul and the disciples from going to places with the gospel. First it's in Asia, and then verse 7 it's Bithynia. Jesus blocks their path, and it's underlined on the screen. They go down to the city called Troas, and they're kind of just waiting there for God to lead them. So on the map, make sure we all understand where we are geographically. Just take a look for a second. This is generally what the Roman Empire looked like in the days of Christ and the days of Paul. We're going to zoom in right around here. Hopefully you know where Jerusalem is and all that. It's all down here. So if we zoom in, now what is, see that? That's modern day Turkey. And the Bible is called Asia Minor. And so you can see Troas right here they're just hanging out in a port city waiting for god to lead them and zoom in even closer to see where we are what is known as paul's second missionary journey and if you look at verses 9 and 10 of Acts 16 paul has this vision of a macedonian man asking him for help what's called the macedonian call and they take that as a sign from god and so they go across you see on the screen there the arrow across the asian sea and acts 16 verse 11 look in your bibles it's so setting sail from troas we made a direct voyage to samothraki that's that island on the screen there samothraki and the following day to neapolis a port city but they have to go inland just a bit to get to philippi that's verse 12 the city of philippi which is a leading city of the district of macedonia and a roman colony So this is modern-day Greece, geographically, Eastern Europe. Now, the city of Philippi, here's some pictures of ruins of what it looks like today. It's named after Alexander the Great's father, King Philip II. Now, demographically, the makeup of the city, very few Jewish people. We're going to see that in the text itself. Not a lot of Jews in the city, a lot of Greeks, obviously, a lot of Romans there as well. And since it was not a port city, it's probably based on agriculture. And usually back then, if that's the case, there's usually a gap between the haves and the have-nots. Probably a very limited middle class. Um, Here's what it looks like today in an overhead shot of the ruins. Here's what it possibly could have looked like. This is ancient Philippi, probably what it looked like in the days of the Apostle Paul. Now, historically, Rome, underneath Augustus, took this city over around 42 B.C., and they granted soldiers to live there. That's why, if you look at Acts 16, verse 12, the very last part of that says it was a Roman colony. That's very important for our story, a Roman colony. So like I said, soldiers, when they conquered the land, were allowed to have land in and outside of the city. And then on top of that, if you're a Roman colony, you have the Ignatian Way. That's the path, the road that allows for trade and travel. You're protected by the Roman Empire. Uh, You don't need the state's permission to buy and sell land. I mean, you have all of these privileges. Probably the biggest one is you're exempt from the heavy Roman tax. Sounds pretty nice. It's, It's a good way to go if you're a Roman citizen and part of a Roman colony. But remember, this is the area where Paul shows up in, at this Roman colony, at this ancient city. Remember, historically, it's full of soldiers and their families. Very patriotic toward Rome, right? Some nationalism toward Rome. It's what they fought for. It's what gives them all these rights and freedoms. And in Roman colonies, such as Philippi, Caesar is Lord. That's the guy. He is it. He's what gives you all these wonderful things. Caesar is Lord. He is King. And if you go back to Acts chapter 16, look at verse 13. There is seemingly no synagogue in this city. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate 
to the riverside where we suppose there's a place of prayer and they meet these God-fearing women there. So it's my speculation and it's not there uh, archaeologically either is there's no synagogue in the city because remember there's very few Jewish people who live there. So you have to literally go outside the city gate as you can see in the right side of the screen there's a river there that's probably somewhere around there where they're meeting for prayer on the Sabbath to the one true God to Yahweh. And look at verses 13 and 14. This woman, Lydia, I like how verse 14 says, it says the Lord opened her heart to what Paul had to say to her. She's hearing the gospel. Talk about an answer to prayer. The good news of the one true king had come to literally outsiders of the city. Now hear the good news and the immediate reaction in verse 15 there is you hear the gospel and they're baptized. That's the reaction to the gospel. Now, she's also a woman of means. You also read there she sold purple clothing. So she's kind of in contact with the elites of the region, the district of Macedonia. And she has a home seemingly big enough to where Paul and his companions can stay. Now, in Philippi, remember that story of the slave girl? Look at verses 16 through 24 here. Um, there's this girl who's possessed by some sort of demon that has this fortune-telling ability about it, but she's a slave. So the masters use her for monetary gains, kind of come here, your fortune, come on down, pay five bucks, and you'll hear what's going to happen to you tomorrow. And she sees Paul and these guys, and look at verse 17. She says this, a demon says this about them, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. It reminds me of James 2. Even the demons believe. And Paul is just annoyed with this. And he's like, I don't need Satan's help. Cast out the demon in the name of Jesus. And of course, the people, the guys who own this girl, I mean, they're livid. There went a, a bunch of money they had coming into their pockets. And on top of that, obviously, they're teaching the gospel because she's saying they're proclaiming salvation. They're hearing about someone else who's Lord. No one else can be Lord, not here. And so they whip up a crowd. They drag Silas. They drag Paul out to the magistrates, the leaders of this city. And look at verse 21, what they say. They say, these guys, they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Like, we can't have this. Only Caesar's Lord. There's all these other ideas that doesn't match up with our thinking. And they took away our money from the demon girl. They're very upset. And the people's almost into like a mob. And they strip their clothes and they beat them. And they're thrown into prison. Here's one jail they found in the archaeological site of the ruins of Philippi. Don't obviously probably wasn't this specific one, might have been, but there's underground passages and whatnot. It's dark, it's small, it's cold, it's cramped. It's all down underground. And this is where Paul and Silas are thrown into jail, unfairly. And look at verse 25. Remember this story? Look at verse 25. After all of this, sitting there bleeding with stocks around their feet, it says they were praying and singing hymns to God. They're joyful. Why? This is a tragedy from the world's point of view. How could anyone, after being beaten and thrown into this dark cell, sing hymns and pray to God? These guys are miraculously born again. I mean, they get it, obviously. This cannot be explained by the world. The world you can't explain this from the world. We desperately need and had better want to be the same as these people. Do we rejoice in our sufferings? For them, it was Christian persecution. It extends beyond that. But do we actually rejoice in sufferings? Do we suffer that much at all? God has blessed us so much here. Are we taking enough risks to consider that there's ever a point in our life that we would suffer? Or is life just comfortable? And that's why it concerns me for years. And I, I, many from my friends, you know, Christians clamor with this fascination of anything in the Bible that can tell them why they have the right to carry a weapon and protect themselves from suffering. Sure, I can give you many verses. I give you many verses. Ephesians 5, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Duh, protect your wife. 
protect your loved ones. Obviously. There are many verses to say that when it comes to the mugger or whatever. Love your, Christ, love your wife as Christ loved the church. What about the rest of that verse and the concept of dying every single day and serving your wife? We talked about this in the men's study. If men understood the responsibility of being spiritual leads in their household, you wouldn't want to be a spiritual leader. You have a unique call. Love your wife. Die daily. It might be in the moment with that burglar. Probably not. It's a daily death of service. Why do so many spend their just trying to find something on, on, on why I can fight back. The New Testament is overwhelmed with commandments, stories, examples. The Bible says rejoice, suffer, die like Jesus. Let's focus on that. That's the miracle. That's the miracle. That's to be born again. Because here's the truth. You don't need to be born again. You don't need the Bible. You don't need the Holy Spirit to encourage us and other human beings to defend themselves. None. You don't need the Holy Spirit for that. We're so ready to fight as Christians. Right, just give me a verse. Because I want to do it. So, So does the world without being changed by Jesus. Protect your loved ones. Duh, I can give you verses for that. What's the real miracle in Acts 16? They're born again to where the point is they're suffering and they're joyful. The world cannot explain that. The prisoners listening, the jailer, can't explain that. They were beaten. They were beaten. The world does not need to ask you for the reason of the hope that is in you. If you make it clear that the hope that is in you is your holster, Nobody is converted because Christians are prepared to just fight the government, fight the Muslims, fight China. This is no good to talk that way. Christianity did not grow by the sword. It died by the sword. Like Jesus, we had better rejoice in suffering because that is not of this world. And you look at verse 27 in this story, this earthquake, a miracle, it frees them. And the jailer, verse 27, I don't know this guy's background, must not be having a good time. He takes a sword, he is going to kill himself. He's going to commit suicide. In verse 28, Paul shouts out, do not harm yourself. And I just stats in a room of this many people, how many people listening online? Stats would say people in this room struggle with depression and other mental battles. God says, don't harm yourself. Jesus says there is a much better uniting factor. I have a way better plan for you than this. So the guy who's about to kill himself, the guy who is there to keep them in jail, is the very man who hears the gospel. And again, verse 33, the response to the gospel is to be baptized. What the world would determine is awful and persecution and unfair and unjust suffering. God's using it for good. For kingdom advancement. In verses 35 through 39, the leaders, the magistrates of Philippi, realized we messed up. Because it was illegal in Roman law to beat Roman citizens without a formal hearing. And Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. And they're freed because of that. And they use their Roman citizenship for kingdom advancement. That's what they use it for. Easily I can compare to America. God has blessed us so much. Are we just using American freedoms, rights, and privileges for me? So I can have a comfortable, safe life just for me? Are we using the amazing freedoms we have God has given us in this nation to advance an eternal kingdom? That's exactly what Paul and Silas are doing. And they're asked to go. In verse 40, remember they meet Lydia there again, and new brethren, and they go. Sounds like they visit again in Acts 20. And even though they may not have been in Philippi for too long, it was long enough for God to work his way to save his people. And the church at Philippi had begun. From this story from being beaten and suffering through Jesus to now a church started throughout the whole city. I invite you to open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We're just going to look at the first couple of verses together. Like all the Bible, it is so valuable. And we're going to see that ultimate joy comes in Jesus. Philippians 1 verses 1 through 2, we'll put it on the screen as well. 
Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I know lots of you are note takers. I'm going to do probably six or seven sermons on this. I don't know if you want to create space for it. But Philippians 1 is just jam-packed with this theme of, of service and sacrifice. And that's where our true joy and contentment in life comes from. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Paul's letters, you might look at this and say, this is different from the other letters. And we don't have time to go through all of his other letters. Here's a good example of what is different. Look at Galatians 1.1 on the screen. Paul, an apostle. Not from man, not through man, but through Jesus Christ. So in all his other books, he'll establish his apostolic authority. Uh, Sometimes even in the middle of his letters, like to the church at Corinth, he says, the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. So you have many times where Paul kind of has to put his foot down as one of the unique 12 divine apostolic authoritative leaders in God's church. But that's not how Philippians begins. As a matter of fact, he mentions someone else. Paul and Timothy doesn't list themselves even as evangelists. He just says, servants of Christ Jesus. So why doesn't Paul mention that he's an apostle with authority from God? And why does Paul even bring up Timothy? Some of you might have better answers. I'd like to hear them. Here's what I thought of. Why does he bring up Timothy, and why does he not mention that he's an apostle? Well, first of all, Paul doesn't need to establish his authority. The point of the book is to encourage the church. Obviously, like Corinth, there was a lot of problems where he had to say, knock it off, and level with his authority. But the theme, secondly, in encouraging them, he wants to show them that true joy, the Christian life, is about being a servant. And there's going to be many examples of that, which is number three. He wants to show unity with a fellow servant in Timothy. Timothy is going to be an example, as well as, of course, Jesus himself, of what it means to serve in the kingdom. So Paul and Timothy, and speaking of serving, that word is important. Servants of Christ Jesus. Now I'm reading out of the ESV. If you are reading out of the NASB or New King James, I like your translation the best. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. Doulos, I mean slaves. Slaves would work too, but we have a very unique time with that here with our history, our shameful history of America when it comes to slavery. Um, This is not the same one-to-one issue, is it? Um, Slavery back then was to pay off debts most of the time. So if you were in servitude, you're a bondservant in a Roman context. Now remember Paul, before he was a Christian, remember that he was a Pharisee. So he was really educated and really knew the old law. I mean, that that was his gig. He knew it. So not only from a Roman context, but a Hebrew background has a lot to say about being a bondservant. Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6. If a slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I'm not going to go out free. If they say their life is wonderful, they're treated graciously, kindly, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. So Paul obviously knows this law. If your life was wonderful as serving this master, you could say, I want to serve him forever. And the marking was the whole, the all in the ear. So also from a Hebrew understanding, a bond servant is someone who has willingly decided to serve their master for life. But also like a slave, you're bought. You see that idea in 1 Corinthians 7. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man in the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he called is a bondservant of Christ. It's paradoxical. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. You're purchased by the blood. But we just communed with together. You're purchased by that blood. And as the reading we had in 1 Peter 2, you get all these kinds of paradoxes. Be subject to the government. Why? Not for the government's sake. For the Lord's sake. So it's to be subject to there. And it goes into Christian persecution. It says, suffer as a Christian. So yeah, of course, you respect 
authority. But as soon as authority gets in the way from obeying God, 1 Corinthians 7 says, who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve man? Or are you going to serve the Lord? And Paul has these ideas in many places. In Romans, it makes you think, he says, you're either slaves of righteousness, or slaves of sin. Jesus said you can either serve God or money. There, there's one way or the other. Who is your master? And we're going to see that throughout the book of Philippians. Do you just look out for yourself? Or do you look out for others around you? And this book is addressed to certain people specifically, to all the saints. Remember, hopefully we realize we're at Philippi. To all the saints. Now the world has many definitions for the word saint. Hey, it's a football team. Just woke up four or five husbands probably. And... Uh, you know, people think saints and cowboys. I forgot the cowboys existed and they've been gone for so long. Uh, the world ha- will use saint for an exceptionally really good person. Like, that person's so good. If you have a Roman Catholic background, you were probably taught that a saint is someone chosen by the church according to their qualifying criteria, I guess. Unfortunately, one of those qualifying criteria, criteria is you have to be dead, so that's unfortunate for them. Um, we don't care what the world thinks, what a saint is or is not. Well, God says the biblical definition of a saint is just a believer in Christ. We sing it in one of our songs. It is anyone who has obeyed the gospel. You're all saints, those of you who are in Jesus. Now that word, hagios, it means holy one. Here's how it's used throughout the New Testament. Holy one. In all of Paul's writings, he uses it like 40 times. And every single time, it's in the direction toward a plurality of people. The point is, there is no such thing as a special class of Christian who earned sainthood. You're all saints in Jesus. And that's not, you're a holy one, not because you're so great yourself, as Nate talked about in the Lord's Supper talk. You're a holy one because of what Christ did at the cross. So when people say, you know, St. Matthew or St. Paul, that's fine. But remember, you're saints too. But if Paul heard us using the term saint exclusively for certain people, he'd strongly object to that. You're all saints in the body of Christ. But it's not just to the general church, to the saints there, right? It's to the overseers and deacons. Overseers. If you're reading out of King James, probably reads bishop. Unfortunate translation, in my opinion. That's kind of more for church tradition. The word is just episkopos. It means overseer. Someone who oversees. So obviously we're talking about what we usually use the term for as elder. Uh, Our church has done a really good job when it comes to uh, biblical organization of our churches. Let me just show you very quickly something that will be interesting to some of you at least. In 1 Peter, Peter writes about elders. He said he exhorts elders, verse 2, to shepherd or to pastor the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight, episcopus. That's the same idea, overseer. That's what we saw in Philippians 1. An elder is a pastor. A pastor is a shepherd. A shepherd is an overseer. Interchangeable words for the same position and job. So here we got three elders, three overseers, if you will, between Zach, Keith, and Nate. And uh, this is something you don't slam on other people. That's not the point. I just want us to realize you know, defined roles in the church. So like I would not be a pastor. Very common term to use me or George as a pastor. You'd call me a preacher, an evangelist, minister of the word, if you will. But pastors are the shepherds who oversee the flock. And scripture says these elders, these overseers are worthy of double honor. That means many things. But make sure always to check in on our elders and their wives. Make sure to thank them for the I mean, the endless effort and service they put toward this church. But it's not just the overseers getting some love from the apostle. It's also the deacons. Diakonos. It means to minister, to be a waiter, or to literally serve someone. Remember in Acts 6, you had the Greek-speaking Jewish Christians, and um, they needed physical service, so you saw this idea of a waiter or a minister to them. And like elders in 1 Timothy 3, deacons also are supposed to have certain qualifications and, and qualities about them. It's their men 
uh, and their wives, I guess you could call them deaconesses if you wanted, they are supposed to be mature, tested. This idea of holding in the mystery of the faith, the women are to be faithful in all things. So deacons and their wives, they meet the physical needs of our church, which have huge spiritual implications. Look what we're doing right now. You know, whether it's the baptistry or our finances or ministering to some of you individually, they're doing lots of work at this church. So always make sure to thank our deacons and their families for all the service that they're given to us. So the church at Philippi, really structurally sound. They got it going on, if you will. And as we mentioned before, overall in this letter, Paul doesn't have to put his apostolic authority uh, down on these people. So this is Caleb speculating, but I have a question. I'm like, why does Paul even mention overseer? and deacons. Because once again, Paul doesn't do this in any of the other letters. It's only in the Philippians that he does this, where he mentions overseers, deacons. If you look at Philippians 4.18, if you got a better answer, please let me know. This is the only thing I could really think of. Maybe I'm thinking too much. Happens a lot. Um, Paul writes them saying, I receive full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, a member of their church, the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So it seems, obviously there's many lessons in the book, but it seems like the letter was initially a response to this financial support. And of course, the saints and the overseers and the deacons obviously the ones who put that together and sent that to Paul. So almost like a thank you, but of course he has many, many, many lessons for them and for us today in this book. So let's look at verse 2 as we begin to wrap up here. Paul gives his signature blessing, if you will. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you. And all 13 of Paul's epistles He'll start his books with grace to you, and such as Philippians as well, the book will end grace with you. Now grace, I mean, it's quite the lifeblood of our faith. If you didn't get to hear him, George did a series on grace. You can find those on YouTube if you're interested. But grace, of course, it's God-given. To whom? You say, well, Christians, believers, true. There's something a little deeper to it. The book of James, God gives more grace Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6. And that's important to realize. Being willing to admit wrong, being willing to admit fault, sin, to be humble. That's the one God gives grace to. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Grace is the foundation to supplying us to do good works that glorify our Father in heaven. But it's not just grace to you. It's grace to you and peace. I'm pretty sure grace and peace are always said in this order. First grace, then peace. Because until you understand, until you walk in the grace of God, you will not have the peace of God until you have the grace of God. And of course, that idea of peace of God will come up later in this book. You could say grace begins when you initially obey the gospel, but you have grace in the middle of your Christian life. When we have moments in our lives where we realize, I've sinned, I was wrong, I need the forgiveness of God. And and there's really just two options, right? One's the biblical way, you trust what Jesus did at the cross. Two's the unbiblical way, which is saying, I'll just be a good person. I'm going to do this, or more importantly, I'm not going to do this. And if I do enough good deeds, then I'll get back right with God and he'll love me again. That's Roman Catholicism. Well, this is not works-based. Grace will change your life to walk that walk. But a big problem with this idea is you'll never know if you've done enough, if you think it's dependent on you. You'll never know. There's no peace in that. I've done good deeds. I've done good deeds. Have I done enough good deeds? That's not peaceful. That's why I said in a Bible class a few months ago that legalists are often unsure of their salvation. Have I earned enough? No peace in your life if you think it's dependent on your works in order to be saved. Because obviously, we're terrible. We're sinners. We're called to live a changed life, not to earn it, but to show that it has changed us. So when we realize grace, 
that it's apart from merit, simply because he's a good, faithful, merciful master who wants to freely give us salvation, that's what's going to change our lives. Because God's mercy is not dependent on what we do. God's mercy is just who he is. And when we realize that, and we understand the grace, now you will have peace with God. And that's to change life. Whereas we alluded to as being bond servants or slaves, as Exodus 21 says, you tell God, pierce my ear. You're a good, faithful servant. I want to serve you for life. After all, we are called saints, holy ones, set apart, but it's not works that's going to cause God to save you. That's already done with Jesus. But grace brings us the peace of God. And it's always supposed to be growing in our lives. Performance-based living, you'll be crushed. You'll have no peace. Trust in Jesus, not yourself. And one quick thing in this verse, notice it's grace to you in peace. It's not just a, a phrase like good luck or what. It, no, this is supernatural. Grace to you in peace from God. That's important. It's not just thrown out there. This is literally from our Heavenly Father. Grace, peace from God Himself. Now remember, Philippi, a Roman colony, loved Rome, very nationalistic about Rome, Caesar's king, Caesar's lord. And yet, in this letter in Philippians 1, who's called Lord? Jesus Christ. That's who the Lord is. And that would have been a big deal in the Roman Empire, especially Roman colonies such as Philippi. And sadly, even God's own nation, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, they would tell you their ultimate authority, they would tell you their one true king was Yahweh. They'd tell you God's our king. And even they, once they got scared of losing power and control, they committed treason against the king of literally all the universe when Pilate in John 19 asked them this, Shall I crucify your king? And even if they didn't think Jesus was God, you'd think the answer would be, we, have, we only respond to Yahweh. That's not the response. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest said, we have no king but Caesar. Committed blasphemy. Even religious people today, you've got to be careful. We can, Christians still can, commit blasphemy when we seek earthly power and control at the expense of holding true to the values of a kingdom that is not of this world. Jesus did not look like a king. He looked like a fool. What king wears crowns? What king, as we talked about the table, is tortured and killed? What kind of king is that? Christians for centuries have looked like fools, suffering, even dying in some cases, joyfully. Go read about the persecution underneath the Catholic Church. How many people are burned at the stake, praising God at that place? I don't know if I have that faith. And yet, He is Lord. And He is coming back. We had better repent. God is a good master. We'd better tell him, pierce my ears. God's grace is sitting there. It was done at the cross. He yelled out, it is finished. You've won the battle. That's what gives us eternal joy. Joy in Jesus that we're going to see throughout all the book of Philippians. And I hope, more importantly, I pray that you have supernatural grace and supernatural peace from our Father in heaven. If you need to repent and come back to the one true king, well, we'd love to pray with you at any time. We'd love to pray with you right now as a church. And if you do not call Jesus your Lord yet, because you're not a disciple yet, you're not even a Christian yet, please come forward while we stand and sing and be baptized in the name of Christ so that Jesus would be your joy.